Welcome to Summit 2020 by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. The summit is a platform where leaders, innovators and pioneers share their perspectives on how we can build an economy that is resilient and re regenerative by design. I am delighted to be joined today by Alan Kay. Alan Kay is a computer scientist, a molecular biologist, a musician, uh, just a general all-round super brain, really. Uh, and he's been incredibly generous with his time uh, with the foundation over the years. Um, and really, I guess, best known for his work at Xerox Park, which kind of laid the foundations for all of the personal computing that we've had and have and use today. Uh, so Alan has been at the heart of, uh, I guess, an, an innovation, an invention, um, breakthrough that really set the foundations of uh, a whole new way of running our global economy. Uh, and we're here to ask what it will take. So what will it take to achieve and realize a circular economy? How do we make it a reality? But we're also here to plug a couple of papers and reports that <laughs> Alan has written and we're aware of, so we'll be dipping into those. So Alan, to kick us off, what will it take? Well, I think it's multi-pronged. The, the two big ones are uh, we have to get uh, a rather large uh, percentage of the population to even understand that there is a problem and that we're actually in the equivalent of a war in which we've already been invaded. And because we're this year we're speaking in the context of the pandemic. It's easier to see what the problem is because people really are dying and not in small number. And yet, when I look out the window here in London, I see people walking around without masks because from their standpoint, well, they can't see it. It's been going on long enough. Uh, the government wants people to get out back to work and into school. And so all of the factors that uh, make it easy for people without developed imaginations to ignore something that's essentially invisible are at play. And we can see this by the uh, second waves that are happening around the world uh, in the United States. In Spain now is per back up once they let it be a vacation spot again. And the R value, according to The Guardian here in the UK, has gone over one again. So we're not good with dealing with invisible problems, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the, so that is huge because uh, the, the, the public not demanding that the government do X, Y, and Z, which they in fact are not doing with the pandemic, um, is probably the biggest factor in being worried right now. Uh, technologically, things are very late with regard to the climate. And all of these exponential problems that uh, we create and are faced with uh, have the very meaning of exponential, which is something, again, that's difficult for people to imagine. But if something is growing exponentially, then waiting the length that you've waited so far, so waiting twice as long, uh, might cost you a hundred times as much energy and effort to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. At some point, the energy and the effort overwhelms uh, the resources that we have. Whereas thinking early, starting early, uh, uh, many things can be done. And so the irony here, and irony is funny if it's little, uh, it's tragic if it's large, the irony here is we live in the most scientific age that humans have ever lived in. And we have the most means to do something about this problem. 
But in fact, the delay has been so long that we're getting very close to some critical points of no return. So the delay here, by the way, for people who are, haven't been tracking this can be traced back to the first uh, large full-scale warning uh, in 1963 by the National Science Foundation of the US based on about five years of the first careful measurements of CO2 in the atmosphere by Charles Keelan of Caltech. And basically the measurements were done so accurately that not only was it possible to state with certainty that the carbon dioxide was a percentage was rising in the atmosphere, but that the rise was exponential. And every more careful measurement, uh, every more careful computer simulation since then has only confirmed this. So even the, the simulations that were done on supercomputers back uh, in the late 60s and 1970s were perhaps uh, 100,000 times less uh, capable than an iPhone. Those simulations, uh, the worst of them was only off by 2% when you look at what has happened since then. So one way to look at it is about 57 years have been squandered and ideas like the carbon tax, uh, uh, trying to use market forces to control it and so forth, uh, could have had some effect 57 years ago. But in fact, bringing them up now is ludicrous. We're so way past that. We're in the middle of a war. And uh, the kinds of... Uh, attention and prioritization that wars have brought about, in particular, having the ordinary public for the first time when they're really frightened to be happy that the federal government is fun funding boffins. Otherwise, uh, everybody is uh, pretty much uh, wary of boffins because uh, that those are those nerds down the hall that aren't part of my society and I don't know what they're doing and, and so forth. So, so we're, in, uh, we're in a period right now where uh, there's still some time uh, and still the means and the brain power to uh, deal with a number of the different factors. And of course, it's not just CO2, but this pay, paper you were talking about, uh, the Saul Griffith paper about mobilizing for a zero carbon America. I urge everybody to read this. Uh, this is not just written by experts, but beautifully written for the intelligent public, and especially uh, aimed at business, because the pitch on it is, uh, if we take advantage of this catastrophe, as Roosevelt, President Roosevelt did of the Great Depression and uh, the opportunities in the tragedy of World War II, what happens is the extra science and engineering and industrial process that's done during these disasters actually winds up uh, benefiting business and actually creates entire new economies invents entirely new things. Um, so uh, there's another uh, earlier book I urge people to look at. It's one of my favorites, got a great title. It's about energy uh, by a physicist, Amory Lovins. Rocky Mountain Institute has been associated with this. And this is again, a bit of a pitch at businesses showing how they can make more money by being good as far as uh, energy and materials and uh, sustainable uh, circular processes and so forth. So all of these- Can I jump in on the Sol Griffith paper? Because um, I guess for those that haven't read it, the headline is, you know, we have all of the technology we need to decarbonize uh, America 
by 2025 on a radically short time horizon. It will cost $3 trillion of government spending and it will create 25 million jobs and it could catalyze up to $20 trillion of private sector investment at the same time. Yeah. So it's a hugely ambitious scenario, but it's also just feels fundamentally possible, right? Um, and how did this kind of play between uh, is this do we need a kind of technology will save us answer? Is this a technology challenge that we face or is oh, it just no. a problem with humans and human? I mean, uh, just to bring up the last of the three papers you mentioned, um, this one called How that I wrote for MacArthur Foundation last year. Uh, I have two quotes by Einstein in the beginning of it. One is we cannot solve our problems with the same kinds of thinking we used when we created them. So the climate problem is a technological. It was created by using technology without paying attention to the whole system in which the technology is used. And then the other Einstein quote I have is, insanity is doing the same kinds of things over and over and expecting different results. So in both, and this is why war is so effective unfortunately, in allowing big breakthroughs to happen. Because it's the, the one time where uh, the hounds of science are unleashed, who on the one hand will not use the same kinds of thinking that were used before. The whole point of science or the meta part of science is Part of what you're finding in science is not just things about nature, but things about human nature and especially things about how we can think more effectively. Science in many ways is a collection of new methods to get around with what's wrong with our old brain. But just so just on that, so if we take that that you know back to the Sol Griffith, is do we have even is it even a, a challenge? A scientific challenge actually to decarbonize America or is it just a political challenge but my take from that paper is it's more of a political challenge well that's what I said in the the two big things to worry about here the biggest one is people and uh, the second one is technological and yes uh, I mean it is it is not a good idea to say well uh, uh, now all we have to do is engineering because uh, for people who don't haven't done engineering ever and for people who haven't ever done science it uh, it looks a bit like magic from the outside but in fact it takes a lot and a lot of effort and one of the books that we talked about last year was the book by General Groves about how the atomic bomb effort was done in World War II. And another one was how uh, both countries shared and mobilized their radar effort. And if you look at the details on this, uh, we're looking at when the atomic bomb effort was uh, maybe six, 600,000 to 800,000 people were actually organized and the US built entirely new towns. They found places where the, for instance, there were resources for cooling uh, uh, and just built a town. And, and one, of the, one of the things in, in the, um, that book is, now it can be told uh, for people who are interested. Yes. One of the things in that was just the priority, right? It was number one priority, that project. So not just in terms of funding, but also access to resources of critical materials that were needed by other departments when it came to you know frontline fighting in the war access to certain metals yeah. or certain well there are actually a number of the was complicated it was done on a scale that um, a country the size of the u.s could pull off and so that that scale uh, is quite a bit larger than uh, smaller smaller countries can imagine and uh, for that project uh, and for the radar project 
radar required not just the invention of radar in all sizes, but for uh, uh, engineering productization and then building radar uh, sets of every size by the hundreds of thousands. So virtually all the radar systems over here in planes and for ground control after the chain home system were built in America from this joint effort. Virtually every radar system in every plane, no matter who made it, if it wasn't the Germans, was built uh, by one of the Route 128 companies around Boston. So, so when you look at industrial level uh, 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 engineering on a large scale, it's uh, the logistics problems are those that governments tend to be terrible about. So if you look at something that's dog simple logistically uh, is testing for uh, uh, the virus. Mm -hmm. These days, neither the UK nor the US could pull it off. US is doing testing now, they don't want to. They're doing it more, and the UK has done a terrible job of testing all around, down the line, including now. So nobody actually knows right now uh, what the actual even situation is. Now, the thing about the climate, there are some unknowns there. Like almost everything that has happened in reality has been slightly worse than, or more, or even more than slightly worse than the simulations. That means there are things that we don't know. For example, uh, this paper by my friend Saul Griffith that we've been talking about um, is only about getting carbon out. It's not removing the carbon from the atmosphere. It is just decarbonizing the industrial process. And it's an excellent analysis of how to go about doing that. But it happens that methane is about 80 times as, uh, 80 per volume, 80 times more of a greenhouse gas. And besides the famous cows that produce a lot of methane, uh, there's an enormous amount of methane runoff now from shale oil production because of uh, natural, natural gas, and there's a lot of me uh, methane in the tundra that is now melting. And there's a lot of methane uh, bound up in the oceans, which are now getting warmer and starting to release it. Nobody knows how much methane there actually is, and it's uh, more difficult to track. So the just doing what the three, three trillion dollar thing that and people say, well, three trillion, that sounds like a lot of money. But in fact, if you look, if you amortize it over the 57 years of not doing anything. Well, and I think also actually another, cheap. another way is that I think the stimulus package signed off by Congress to, you know, you know, to, for the rebuild or the, to deal with COVID was about two trillion. Yes. No, it's, I mean, this is why governments are in a favorable position to do something because governments have the ability, uh, unlike companies and unlike states, governments can print money when they need it. They just have to control for an inflation when they do that. And so they do print money uh, when in times of war and other disasters. But I think it's important for people who pride themselves on being practical people who worry about money and taxation and all that stuff to uh, first divide 57 into uh, the three trillion dollars and then to realize that if things were started 50 years ago it was not three trillion dollars that need to be spent we're spending three trillion dollars because of the 57 years of not doing anything and so one way of thinking about this is that the three trillion dollars represents a debt that in this case the united states put itself into by not doing anything they were amortizing 
profits into the future by not spending the entire amount to deal with the entire system. And now those debts are becoming due one way or another. We either have to spend money, which to me is preferable, or we're going to take the debt from nature when nature comes to collect. And there are many indications that nature is definitely starting to collect in a number of different ways. For instance, the, the hurricanes, uh, again, were simulated years ago to see what happens when you raise the uh, water temperature just a degree and, or a degree and a half uh, centigrade. And you can wind up with uh, what are called super hurricanes, hurricanes that are powerful enough to sustain themselves over land. And you don't want to get into that nonlinear region because we depend now on a landfall of a hurricane for damping it out. It can't sustain its heat engine, but the larger ones can. So these nonlinearities, again, are things that most people in the public and in politics really don't have imagination or use the tools to try to get scared enough. It's like uh, my favorite icon of this whole movement is Greta. And Greta doesn't claim to know the science, but she, she's smarter than almost anybody out there in the public when she says you have to really follow the science. You have to pay attention to it because it's the best thing that we've got. And so this is what people are not doing. They're instead relying on their common, like the people walking outside without masks, or relying on their common sense that maybe they don't know somebody who's died from it, and so it's somebody else's problem and so forth. So this doesn't work because uh, if you look at the 9 billion people we're going to have on the planet by the end of the century, and think about the amount of uh, just random waste uh, and pollution of every kind, including the uh, some of the uh, countries that are trying to industrialize now, like India, primarily through coal. Basically, they, they aren't going to stop exploiting coal until somebody invents something and offers, it, offers to replace it. Right, right now, they view their priorities as being very close in and they have a, uh, more than a billion people to worry about before you start worrying about the whole planet going to hell. So Alan, maybe just to, because um, I think it's clear that your point is we're not, we're not scared enough collectively as, as a human society. And we're not treating this like the existential crisis it is. And we are not therefore putting the level of pressure on our governments primarily seem to be your, you know, your thesis, right? Not, primarily not putting enough pressure on the government to trigger the type of response that is needed. Well, I think you have to put the pressure has to be on the governments because that is where the money, the extra money in the crisis is most easily generated. As I said, the smaller entity, there's a lot of things you could do about uh, changing the reward system for businesses that would help by passing laws. But uh, basically, there's a lot of new things that have to be done that uh, you, you're not really going to get out of trying to get individual businesses to do it. You can get them to be nicer with regard to society. But I think the governments are the place that have to, just with the, just with the, the, the pandemic. The other part of it is that uh, democracy is tricky. So the reason uh, why we don't have pure democracies over the last 250 years when democratic systems were set up is precisely because 
of the difficulties of resolving different opinions in a timely fashion. So the basic idea in a democracy is the democracy part of it is supposed to have every citizen feel like they have an equal voice in choosing the representatives who are supposed to be more efficient about making decisions and hopefully brighter about making decisions than say the middle of the bell curve of the entire population. That's the basic idea behind a democratic republic. And um, so just pointing the finger at America, I dare say an enormous percentage of American citizens have no idea about how things are supposed to run at all because they've been running relatively well and so they can spend much more of the percentage of their time worrying about their own affairs and the media provides a lot of legal drugs for keeping them distracted so somewhat like the bread and circuses idea of rome and so the so the trick is when something desperate is happening in theory, it's the government that should respond first and then start trying to convince the public that there's a problem. In the US's case in World War II, it, Roosevelt did a lot of things before Pearl Harbor. But in fact, the US was an isolationist, did not want to help Europe particularly, and, and so forth. Roosevelt did. Uh, Pearl Harbor changed everything because now it became simple in most Americans' minds. Hey, somebody attacked us, we have to attack back. And a lot of things came out of that. It's a hell of a way of making decisions. Uh, over here in the UK, it was not dissimilar because radar uh, was not an initiative of the, of the UK government. Not at all. It was an initiative of a few scientists, especially Henry Tizard. And by hook and by crook, they invented the technologies starting when Hitler came to power in 1933. And um, by doing this and that, they were able to get enough funds to build the chain home system through both the, the Baldwin and Chamberlain governments, which were both isolationist. They're both appe appeasement. And, but uh, when the Germans did fly over in 1939, the chain home system detected them because pe people had looked ahead like science does, and they had done the, uh, the engineering. And so uh, uh, the Battle of Britain was won by Britain, not by Germany. It could have gone the other way quite easily. So the problem with these lessons from history is um, it's so abstract. It's, there's something not uh, emotionally gripping enough. And possibly it's because too much of history has been represented in movies and it's just a movie. The actual deadliness of these wars doesn't hit home to people. And so, like in America, uh, a few people noticed that uh, Donald Trump and his cohorts were using many of the same uh, techniques that Hitler used. And of course, we haven't gone to that place that Hitler got to even in 1933. It's less dire in the United States. But in fact, most Americans have no idea what happened in the 30s. And so they can't use any of those, uh, uh, any of that history to help them be careful about similar kinds of authoritarianism uh, that are happening now. So this happens over and over again. This is a cliche, it's a trope. but. In, in fact, it's really important because, uh, you know, it's like the joke about the sparrow building the nest again in the drain pipe. Because when it's not raining, why not? 
Yeah, so we're not heeding the, the warnings. Just on the um, uh, democracy point, and you know, if we just think about the Sol Griffith paper and the fact that that you are, someone is able to present this very ambitious scenario for decarbonizing America, even though that's not all of the problem. You know, actually, one of one of the reasons why that is possible today is because the renewable energy technologies that have been developed over the last ten years further. Um, and really that China has put a lot of effort into uh, producing those at scale and bringing the cost right down. And that, that's, a, I, my mind just went, when you mentioned, the, you know, democracies can be tricky in the balance of authoritarian regimes, you know, there, there, there is something in that, that China decided to take a leadership position here in producing this technology for the rest of the world. Well, and, it's, so it's easy for China to see it's in their best in. You know, one of one of my favorite technical guys, Gordon Bell, pointed out that every ten years, American manufacturing shifts a thousand miles uh, westward. So it shifted over to Japan, then it's shifted over to China, and maybe next in India. And so you have two kinds of things going on. You have countries that are trying to get up to a certain level of industrialization. And uh, hooker by crook, they're willing to work for less. And so it's to their best interest to get interested in that. Um, and the US especially doesn't, thinks it's, the business thinks it's in their best interest to get a lower cost on goods because it means higher profit and that's how business is measured quarter by quarter. What they don't realize is when they send the manufacturing west, they're also sending uh, much of the expertise for manufacturing west. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the US would be hard, US is having a hard time just getting uh, astronauts into orbit again. Whereas it was all done in, in about seven years or so, back in the 60s when it was really hard. Um, the US would have a very hard time uh, doing uh, a nuclear reactor right now. That expertise has uh, moved off and it's likely that some nuclear power and particularly nuclear fusion, which is hugely underinvested in right now, uh, is not gonna happen in a timely way. So this outsourcing idea sounds good if you're just in business. But from the standpoint of any society and the expertise that societies need, it's a terrible idea. You need perfect, the more you outsource, the more perfect the cooperation and longevity of cooperation is actually needed for stability. And of course, that is not actually the case with uh with china so uh yeah and i think the lesson to be learned from the japanese and china le lesson to be learned from japan was they suffered a lot wound up suffering a lot more as the result of world war ii than the u.s did but unlike the US, their vacuum tube electronics capability was completely done in. They didn't have a legacy infrastructure. And so it was much easier for them to adopt the newly invented transistor invented in the US, but the Japanese were the ones that exploited it because they were the ones that did flat screen displays. They didn't have a huge legacy in CRTs. Right, so uh, the big problem in America was they couldn't let go. And I have a, a video, uh, which I won't show, but it's fun because it's, it shows uh, how to catch a baboon in Africa. And the way you do it is you poke a hole in a, in a wall, like an anthill, put some seeds in there, let the baboon see your doing it and back off a ways, the baboon will go and put his hands in the hole and grab the seeds. And 
will not let them go. Will not let them go. The hunter can walk right up to the baboon. The baboon is going crazy, but he won't let go of those seeds. Mm -hmm. So this is a cognitive bias in all primates called loss aversion. When we have something, we can't let it go. And very often you have to let the thing go if it's not serving uh, the current uh, parameters of the moment. And the U.S. Uh, can't let things go. Uh, in fact, one of the most interesting things I read recently is British Petroleum is going to try to go into new energy rather than, um, so I'm tracking that. If they can do that and are willing to share their industrial process for doing that with other companies, it's the kind of thing that most companies need because from their standpoint, anything that requires them to not make money just for the good of the human race, that is a very tricky proposition. They will hang on to what they think is their, you know, their local uh, reason for existence, regardless of the answer. Hang on to their nuts, and to use your anecdote. But I mean, that's so true for circular economy in a way, right? That it does require a f businesses really to completely reinvent their business model. And I mean, it, it's it's ideas. a tough. If, if you work it out economically, if you don't look look at it, this is about jobs. But if you work work it out economically. And by the way, this has been done a number of times, even going back into the late 60s, into the 70s by the whole earth community in California, looked at circular, circular economies at every level from a circular house, of which one was built in Berkeley, California, uh, to circular large things that were completely self-sustaining. The basic, the bottom line of it is you have to pay more of the costs earlier than human beings have been used to paying uh, since the Industrial Revolution started. One way of looking at econ the economics of the Industrial Revolution is to only pay the costs that you absolutely have to with a gun held to your head. And anything you can amortize to the future has been amortized to the future. So this includes waste both on the planet and into the atmosphere, uh, which is something that's going to cost you later. But the hope is, uh, well, I'll be dead and gone by the time that bill comes due. So uh, if you go into a if you do a, the, a circular economy, and look at what you have to pay for. You have to pay, uh, do something about, for instance, the trillions of tons of plastic waste that's now in the oceans. And uh, one of the estimates I saw was that uh, the part that's floating is, is the smaller part. That there's much more than you can see floating in the Pacific gyre. On the bottom, so uh, that has to go somewhere. Something has to be done about dealing with containers. I feel guilty being in lockdown because I rely on Amazon, and Amazon packs everything nicely, but the amount of uh, corrugated cardboard that we discard here every week is frightening. And we do recycle, but still. Uh, so paying for that up front, I think is one of the toughest propositions. Uh, you know, a good, a good saying for all of this is everybody loves change except for the change part. And I, so you can have uh, many conferences uh, are kumbaya, conferences where everybody agrees that they're thinking virtuously about this stuff, but it's hard to get businesses to actually cut into their profit margin 
to do what's needed, to do their part of what's needed for the larger thing. They're not getting any credit from the way they think about it. So I, I personally think giving businesses tax credits for being good right now is actually uh, an excellent way to go because it appeals to uh, you know, their smaller sense of mission. And before you try and enlarge their sense of mission, you're probably better to just give them credit for, you know, keep their profits kind of where they are, but get them to do more for them. Let's set the rules of the game and put the right incentives in I think, place. I think that's what governments are for. I mean, one of the things that is not a joke exactly in the U.S. is that uh, the simple way of characterizing these days is is the Democrats want to govern and uh, the Republicans want power. And the, ma the major complaints about the, by the Republicans of the Democrats are essentially, hey, they, they, want, to, they want to govern. They want to govern the country, country and we want to harvest the country. And all these laws are so inconvenient so they've been doing away with them right and left. They're just getting in the way of this harvesting that we feel is, it is our right to do. Alan, we've got 15 minutes left, so I kind of want to change tack a little bit. And I wanted to, um, <clears throat> because- you're getting, that, you're getting that sailing talk. <laughs> yeah, although I'm absolutely not a sailor by any stretch. <laughs> well, the number one thing in, Sailing, the big invention in sailing was a keel, which allows you to potentially sail in the direction of the wind uh, twice as fast as, you can, as the wind can blow. It's one of the great inventions of all time, and it's a great metaphor, and the MacArthur Foundation should absolutely use it, given, uh, given uh, your founder. Yeah. That, you know, coming up with a fabulous invention that does what people for thousands of years thought could was impossible yeah. to do, which is to even sail in the direction uh, that the wind is coming from. Can't okay. sail directly. Let me, let me take that example. So, because what I wanted to do is we say, look, the keel is an example of an invention that was breakthrough and it enabled a whole new set of possibilities. Incredible. And in your paper, how? Um, when you talk about Xerox Park specifically, you list a number of organizing principles. I wouldn't know what the terminology is. Um, I just want to throw... Heuristics. Heuristics, okay. I want to throw a couple of them at you and just see if you can uh, riff for us on what, what, do, you, what do you mean, what, what did they mean? And, and in practice, like how, how did they play out? And, and I think the reason why I think this is important is I think it's it's really helpful to to demonstrate the way we should be working the way we should be organizing the cultures we need to have to be able to be in a proper problem solving space and creative thinking space okay so let me chuck uh the first one at you um so the goodness of the results correlates most strongly with the goodness of the funders definitely that that should be up close to number one um Certainly the, and by goodness uh, means not the amount of money. There's tons of money uh, being put into investment now and in the computing fields. But the, much of it is top down in a variety of ways. And the, the key towards, uh, of, much of what happens in science and much of what happened at Xerox Park and the ARPA community was uh, letting the people most likely to have a feel for new directions, to find problems rather than be given them. And uh, I think the point that goes along with that uh, mantra is that uh, when a person has spent a good part of their life getting in a position to do funding. They haven't been doing science or engineering. 
they've been doing something that accumulates money or uh, winds up getting in con being a go between for the government. They're doing something that isn't because science and engineering is not about money at all. It's about uh, engineering is about making things in principled ways, and science is about understanding things. And the two of those things are full time jobs. And so the the insight of the ARPA and park funders was. Uh, we're much better off if we fund the smartest people we can find who have a burning urge to contribute to our vision. Our vision doesn't say how it's to be done, but it's a vision of uplifting humanity by helping it think better and communicate better. So and is there something in there that the problem now, or, you know, what is, I guess, what was unique about ARPA is there was a level of trust. It, you know, people, yeah. the people with the money didn't get involved with the programming. They just trusted the team to yeah, achieve it. Was an un, it was an unusual situation. It, ARPA happened because of Sputnik. So it was very much a creation of the Cold War. So Sputnik was in 1957, and a couple of months later, President Eisenhower set up ARPA, originally run by the military, and originally having something to do with space and missiles and stuff like that. But uh, in, starting in the early 60s, they decided uh, that ARPA should be run by scientists. And so the next four or five ARPA directors were all, I think, former physicists. They were heavy duty scientists who were doing service uh, for the country coming in uh, to run this. And they knew how science worked. And, and they knew also that, you know, probably 90% of the funding they were going to spend uh, was going to be for identified problems. It's not like you try and do everything, but they also understood that you have to, uh, and it's sound what's called portfolio investment policy to have some small percentage of sometimes called mad money, money that you're not going to cry if it is entirely unsuccessful. And uh, that, that figure in a, in a technological company uh, might be something like 5% of 10%, of, of 10% 10 of the uh, uh, revenues of the company might be spent in R&D. Hewlett Packard spent 14. And of that, you might spend uh, one to 5% for mad money. So Park was mad money. It was a tiny, it was just a few tens of millions out of, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that Xerox spent for R&D. So, and uh, Park was set up by another physicist who was the chief scientist, Jack Goldman. He understood how all this worked and it was set up uh, in the light of the 60s to see what ARPA had been doing. He wanted to do something like that for Xerox. So the, and then they got another scientist in who they trusted, uh, uh, Licklider, to start the uh, information processing techniques, the computer research within ARPA. And his idea was uh, nobody uh, is going to wind up doing even a halfway good job if it's a job. So his idea is uh, just be the deputy, you know, the director of, of this set of research for two years. You're, on your last year, you train your replacement. So it's really a three-year thing. That high turnover, keep people interested. Well, yeah, well, basically he said you can't, the Beltway is the 
is the road that goes around Washington, D.C. And he said, you can't have any ideas in the Beltway. <laughs> it's, it's too fraught with politics. There's too much noise and stuff. So, In answering the first one, you've kind of covered a lot of the other ones because the other ones were fun people, not projects, which is, I, yeah. you know, really um, the big, big one, which I hope you have on your list that I mentioned there is, uh, in the U.S., we'd say it's it's baseball, not golf. Yeah, that was the next one, yeah. But I don't know what the I've, – I've never really checked into cricket to see what the batting – but in, in in baseball, if you if you get a hit 30% of the time that you're up at the plate, uh, you're considered to be a good ball player. And Licklider said to me when people ask, well, uh, you know, isn't this – risky and he said well we're not going to cry when we lose a stroke like people do in golf this is baseball and we'll, we'll be happy if we get 30 or 40 percent yield from all of these projects that we're funding and they said well what about all the failures and he said well not getting a hit in baseball is not a failure it's overhead you're it's really hard to hit a fast round thing with a fast round thing and it's like the cost of learning, the cost of refining. And yeah. And so he said, we don't know who's going to be successful. All these people are abstractly similar in the sense that they're top people. They're all uh, sincerely uh, excited to do this. It's not just, it's not really about making money. You couldn't really make money back then. And this is about a quest. It's romantic and so forth. We don't know who's going to be successful, but if we, if we get 30 to 40 percent yield, given what we're funding, the glider said, uh, we will change the entire world. Because 30 or 40 percent of these projects, uh, whatever they are, is going to be earth-shaking in every sector, including uh, in the commercial sector. So that is exactly what, what happened. That is really hard to get uh, politicians, bureaucrats, people in companies, you know, the financial people in companies can't deal with the overhead idea in this context. They look at it is, as this thing is not re giving us a return on investment. But in fact, what you're doing is, and in fact, like the MacArthur Foundation in the U.S., a different MacArthur, but what they do is uh, every year they give 30 or 40 people who have made some tracks uh, five years of blank check funding. So they give them $125,000 a year for five years and they don't care whether these people, these people are artists and science, scientists, writers, they don't care whether any one person does anything. But the thing that they do know is people who are essentially in the arts, whether it's the traditional arts or the arts of science or engineering, are called to it. It's like being called to being a physician or being called to being a minister. They're not doing it for money. It's not a profession. It is actually something that they, you know, an artist is a person who cannot not do art. They will do it for nothing. And so the idea of the MacArthur Foundation in the U.S., well, we'll just fund these people who, they're young, they're, they've done a few things. Let's just give them five years uh, where they don't have to scrabble and see what they do, and uh, we'll be happy if some of them do something. And that is exactly the way it works out. And So this was done after ARPA, but because it exists now and ARPA doesn't, DARPA is not ARPA because that exists now, you could, you could characterize what uh, was done in the 60s was MacArthur type funding for groups. Uh, engineering requires, is, is not really a solo pursuit. And even when you're doing science in computing, you have to do a lot of implementation because you don't get to prove theorems about most of the things you're really interested in. You have to actually build things and vet the ideas by actual uh, engineering. So it's a, it's a complicated process. It requires people 
who are have a scientific bent but also have a feeling for engineering it requires people who are engineers who have a feeling for science it requires tinkerers it requires people who are mathematicians but of the type that work in science rather than rather than completely abstractly and um, it's the kind of people that we've been talking about in these huge efforts in World War II and what Saul Griffith, uh, who was one of these, by the way, he's one of the most talented engine. I hate to, no, engineering is actually a noble profession. It's gotten, it, it, it does, it's never gotten its due. It sounds more blue collar to people, but um, it's one of the great professions of all time. And Saul Griffith is one of the great engineers and designers of recent years. So he is a really interesting person to track and to see what he's done and how he thinks about things and, and so forth. So, I mean, there's something in there about uh, multidisciplinary, or something about communities. Yeah, not but it's like basically tolerance for risk. There's something else in there. Yeah, um, we're, we're kind as of, I mentioned in this paper, yeah. Um, which I hope people will read because basically reading is a good idea. I mean, it's, it, it seems weird to say that these days, but it's been so de-emphasized. It's, it's really the best way to think about things because you get to control the process and you can reread things and you can think about things. So listening to a couple of talking heads and thinking you're getting an education or something, uh, it, it doesn't cut it. Um, but uh, the way to the way to think about this stuff is precisely that in the, the pathway that led to ARPA in part could be traced back to the radar effort at MIT, which required was one of the first times in history on a large scale where seriously good scientists and engineers uh, worked together interchangeably. And much of the industrial process that has come out of that uh, goes can be traced back to that. And also for science, big, big science, that it was through this process in World War II where they started building larger accelerators and putting much more engineering into science to probe uh, the the areas that uh, we can't get to directly and just by thinking about it. yeah so the interdisciplinary thing is is critical yeah okay we've got to we've got to call it there but we have linked the papers in this talk there are two papers in the book that you've you've referenced today the papers are a 20 to 30 minute read they're both highly digestible they're not really scary technical i mean there are bits of the energy one no, I, I think both i i was thrilled with the saul griffith paper because it is so readable it's a fabulous read and i put a lot of effort into the one i wrote for you guys last year to make it as readable as i could possibly do it and it is so read the papers uh check out the references at the back particularly on alan's paper because that has links to all kinds of other books and uh i guess reports that we kind of touched on throughout the conversation thank you so much alan for giving us an hour of your time again um take care look forward to seeing you next year hopefully summit 2021